Who ever coined the phrase, sleeping like a baby? Because we all know that babies don't sleep well, don't we? It's part of what we sign up for when we have a baby. And it's completely normal for them not to sleep well. It's very good for biological and evolutionary reasons they don't sleep through the night. It's protective. They have tiny stomachs and very fast metabolisms, and they need to have milk regularly through the night. They're also helpless and vulnerable and need to be reassured regularly through the night that they're safe. Under the age of one, a baby's sleep is quite different from older children and adults. Their neural pathways are still being formed. However, what happens when that sleepless baby becomes a sleepless child and those broken nights go on for months or years and we still have a child who's not sleeping? What happens if we're sleepless adults? Sleep problems are common. About 40% of adults, 50% of children and 80% of children with a special educational need or disability have, have sleeping difficulties at any one time. So who do we turn to for help and support if we're struggling with our sleep or our children are struggling with their sleep? I was a nurse for 34 years and for the last 20 years of my career I worked with babies and children and families. I did a specialist public health nursing degree alongside health visitors and we had not one session on sleep not one. So the health visitor or school nurse that you go to for help with your baby or your toddler or your child who isn't sleeping, that professional has no training to help you unless it was a special interest of theirs. As an adult, you might go to your GP for help when you don't sleep. But unless your GP has a special interest, they too won't have done any specific training about sleep. Sleep is one of the four pillars of health alongside food, water and exercise. It's not a passive process, it's a really active process and a huge amount goes on while we're asleep to keep us well. We all know that we should drink water, eat five portions of fruit and veg every day, exercise for 30 minutes every day, but sleep? Nobody tells us about sleep apart from the vague idea that we should have a good bedtime routine or get about eight hours. Our children learn lots of things at school as part of their PHSE curriculum, but they're taught nothing about sleep unless they get to A-level psychology. So most of us know very little about what goes on when we're asleep. And then when it evades us, we're left trying to make it happen with little understanding of the process and health professionals who can't help us. My mission, my passion is to help everyone wake up to sleep. So I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour through the real fundamentals of what happens during this really mysterious process. The first thing to say is that it's completely normal for us to wake during the night. It's a myth that we should get eight hours straight. If you are somebody who gets up in the night, what might be happening is that you're reverting to a pre-industrial sleep pattern. If you were able to catch up on your sleep at another time, that wouldn't be a problem. Unfortunately, nine to five life gets in the way. And it's that vital sleep that gets sacrificed, gets squeezed at by, from either end. The, our late nights and our early mornings. We also all have times when we don't sleep well because we're stressed or anxious or we're bereaved. And for most of us, when that anxious time has passed, we go back to sleeping well. For some people, though, that sleeplessness becomes a habit, becomes entrenched, and they end up living with insomnia. I want to normalise broken sleep. Periods of disrupted sleep do not mean that you are broken. But if you understand more, and if you understand um, how sleep happens, 
you may prevent those episodes of poor sleep becoming long-term insomnia. The area of our brain which governs sleep is actually very primitive. It hasn't caught up with that nine-to-five modern life. It's stuck in a world where we got up with the sun and the warmth and we worked outside and hunted and gathered all day. When the sun went down and it wasn't safe to be outside, when it got cooler, we'd come indoors to candlelight or dim gaslight and cool temperatures. So our brains are expecting warmth and bright light during the day and coolness and darkness at night. These are the ancient external cues that govern our body clock or circadian rhythm and tell us where we are in the sleep-wake cycle. Our circadian rhythm you would expect to be about 24 hours because that's the length of our day. But in fact, it's actually 24 hours and 11 minutes. Some very clever people have measured it. If our body clock were allowed to run on, we would gain 11 minutes every day and very quickly get out of sync with the day-night cycle. It needs the information coming from our environment to reset us back to 24 hours every day. The most important thing is exposure to bright daylight. If you take nothing else away from my talk, it's that you need to get out into bright daylight every day. Compare our modern nine to five life to that pre-industrial life that I just described. Rather than getting up with the sun and going to bed when it's dark, we get up when life dictates that we have to, for work or for school. We stay indoors most of the day and our buildings are warm. Indoor light levels are enough to allow us to see colour and black and white, but they're not at the level which tells us where in the day-night cycle we are. And then we come home in the evening to our centrally heated houses and we switch on our electrical devices, our laptops, our tablets, our phones, and we get a burst of blue light. So rather than having bright light and warmth in the morning and coolness and darkness in the evening, we're having warmth and low light levels all day and then warmth with a burst of bright light in the evening. It's completely upside down. Our brain doesn't know which way is up when we live in this way. It's why COVID had such a huge impact on sleep. We stayed at home and we saved lives and we missed out on getting the daylight that we needed. So how does our brain gather this information that it's getting from the outside world and what does it do with it? In our eyes, we have rod cells and cone cells, which help us to see. Relatively recently, in scientific terms, researchers in Oxford discovered that we have additional cells in our eyes, which pick up light levels. They're nothing to do with our vision. That information is sent to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, a tiny area of our brain, only about 10,000 cells. And once it knows whether it's day or night and it resets itself back to 24 hours, anchors that 24-hour cycle, it sets off a chain of events which govern all manner of body processes. It's rather like the conductor of an orchestra for all of those processes. It keeps them running together, it keeps them in sync, playing the right tune. And the rest of our body follows that 24-hour cycle that's been set. It starts these processes off, but it also recognises that they're happening. It's a feedback loop. During the day, when, we, when it's light, we work, we socialise, we eat, we drink. On the whole, we don't tend to do those things while we're asleep. They act as additional cues and they keep reinforcing to our brain that it's daytime. At night, our body recognises the dark and the cool and the lack of food and drink and talking and socialising and tips us into night mode. You can start to see how shift work can mess with our sleep because when our bodies are expecting to sleep, 
we're doing activities that we associate with the day. One of the important processes that happens in response to external cues is the production of hormones. And I'm going to talk about two in particular. When we wake up in the morning, we produce a really huge burst of a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol gets us up, it gets us out there, it makes us alert, it sends glucose to our muscles, it speeds our heart rate up, increases our blood pressure. It's getting us ready to go out and hunt and gather our food. It should tail off as the day, day goes on, but crucially, cortisol is also one of our fight and flight hormones. We produce it when we need to run away from a threat or a danger. If we are anxious, if we're worried, if we're in pain or we're bothered about something, we lay there with our mind going round and round. We distract ourselves all day if we're having a, a difficult time. We stay busy, we work, we surf the net, we watch endless rubbish TV. But then when we get to bed, it's just us and our brain. Stress and anxiety are the modern day equivalent of something that we need to run away from, that might eat us. So we're flooded with that fight and flight hormone. Is it any wonder that we can't sleep at those times? When it's dark and it's cool, we produce a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone of darkness, not of sleep. Nocturnal animals produce melatonin when they're out trundling around. It's crucial for all the processes that happen when we're asleep. Reducing inflammation, rebooting our immune system, scavenging for free radicals, repairing broken cells. Our children grow while they're asleep. When our brain knows whether it's day or night, when it's had the right cues at the right time, it will produce cortisol and melatonin at the right time. When modern life gets in the way, so we don't get out into the daylight, when we're eating late into the night because we've got 24 hours access to food, when we're working when our bodies are expecting us to sleep, our circadian rhythm gets out of sync. The repair, the immune system reboot, the reduction in inflammation doesn't happen and it makes us vulnerable to chronic disease if we don't sleep well for a long time. Alongside the rhythms and cycles of sleep which govern our day and night cycle and tell us where we are, we also go through cycles when we're asleep. Thinking back to our ancestors, it makes no evolutionary sense to be asleep for eight hours, to be unconscious for eight hours. It makes us vulnerable to predators, to extremes of weather, to fire and danger. What our brains have evolved to do is to sleep in cycles of 90 minutes, and we still do this. Every human on the planet does this. We partially wake up every hour and a half and unconsciously check for any change, anything which is a threat to our safety. In a group or community of people living in close quarters, having people waking regularly at different times during the night keeps the group safe. If when we wake, everything is the same, what we do is we turn over and go back to sleep. We don't even know that we've woken. Think about yourself this evening when you go home and you go to bed. You'll switch the lights off, you'll turn the TV off, you'll double lock the front door and close the windows. When you go to sleep, your house will be quiet and dark. If when you get to the end of a sleep cycle, you can hear somebody roaming around downstairs or the TV on, you would wake really fast. We call these things sleep associations. The environment that we go to sleep in is the environment that we expect to continue through the night. And if it changes, it'll wake us fully. Think about our children. We ask them to go to sleep when the house is busy. Early evening, we're still up. There's noise, there's light. For the first few cycles of their sleep, nothing changes. And then when we go to bed, we tiptoe into their room and we switch off the light. We cover them up. We might pull the door to. 
the next time they wake, their environment is very different. There's no light coming under the door. There's no noise downstairs. These are the times that they will then wake and seek reassurance. Many of the families I work with, the parents will tell me, my children go to sleep fine and as soon as we go to bed, they're up every hour and a half. That's why. So to summarise, our primitive brains are expecting warmth and light in the day and coolness and darkness in the evening. They're expecting us to eat and talk and be busy during the day and to rest and be quiet and be cool at night. They're primed to check every 90 minutes throughout the night for any changes which may pose a threat to our safety. There will always be people who do the wrong things and still sleep well. But if you or your child is struggling... Understanding a little bit more about how and why we sleep may help you to make small changes. These changes give our bodies what they're expecting in order to sleep well and can make all the difference. Like giving a plant soil and water and sunlight, if you give your body what it needs, it's much more likely to sleep well. There's so much more to sleep, but I hope this has given you food for thought about your sleep and those that of your children. I'll end by returning back to the question which I posed at the start, which is who do we turn to for help and support? We are really lucky in the UK at this time. Two months ago, the sleep charity set up a national sleep helpline, which I'm really privileged to be part of. From Sundays to Thursdays, between 7 and 9 p.m., Anybody of any age with a sleep problem can ring and speak to a specialist sleep practitioner. When the helpline was set up, we expected most of our calls to come from parents who weren't sleeping and their children. We were actually quite surprised to find that a good proportion of our calls are coming from older people who are having trouble sleeping and have never received any help from that. This is a service for any age. Please use us. Thank you.